You are listening to the Motherhood Unstressed Podcast, and I'm your host, Liz Carlisle. Welcome back. Welcome to a fresh week. I'm so glad that you're here and that you pressed play and that we are spending this time together. Um, Here in Georgia, the state is slowly opening back up. It has been interesting to say the least. I still think people are, for the most part, staying at home, um, definitely doing social distancing, but you can feel the energy start to shift, at least here. And depending on where you're tuning in from, um, it may be happening where you are or it may not. But it's, it, there is definitely a stark difference than where we were even last week. You can feel it. Um, and with that, you know, comes the thought of stress. And it's really what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about stress as a reality, as a universal reality for all of us, um, and how that can lead to burnout and what burnout actually is, and then how to mitigate that. And I am so thrilled to present the work of my guest to you today. His name is Dr. Greg Hammer, and he's actually a Stanford University professor. Um, He's a pediatric intensive care physician, a pediatric anesthesiologist, and he's just come out with a new book called Gain Without Pain, The Happiness Handbook for Healthcare Professionals. And this is a conversation about stress, about burnout, and you know, strategically what you can do to mitigate that so that you can live a joyful, blissful life, which is what this show is all about. So I hope you love it. If you do, please share it with a friend. Please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. That really does so much for the show. And I'm so eternally grateful for you if you've left a review um, or if you do today. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, without further ado, please enjoy my episode with Dr. Greg Hammer. Now, you know, Mother's Day is right around the corner, but there is still enough time to grab your Motherhood Unstressed CBD Mother's Day gift bundle at motherhoodunstressed.com. And what is included in this gorgeous gift package? Well, there's the 500 milligram soothing scent balm. You've got the full spectrum gel caps and also the 500 milligram tincture. And all of that is wrapped up for $89. Normally this would be well over 150. So now is the time to head on over to motherhoodunstressed.com Click the shop tab and get your bundle today. Well, hello, Dr. Hammer. Welcome to the show. I'm so glad that you're here. We were talking before, you know, I have so many people in my life in the healthcare industry, so many people listening do as well. So thank you for being on the show to talk about this important issue. My pleasure. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. So just to kind of give our listeners a little bit of background about you, take us through your journey to talking specifically about this work. What was the spark that led you to doing this work? Burnout in medicine has become uh, a substantial problem, and uh, I've experienced it myself. And so I have always been interested in wellness, and I think the combination of my long-term interest in in fitness and spiritual health, combined with my experience as a physician, seeing people around me getting progressively burnt out, uh, some of them leaving medicine, some of them leaving Stanford, Um, some of them committing suicide, unfortunately, all I think in combination, uh, spurned my interest in, in wellness for healthcare workers. And so I started giving talks on this to my trainees and medical students and residents and fellows, and that seemed to resonate. And then I, uh, joined an organization at Stanford for wellness and started getting invited around the country and then the world talking about wellness in medicine. And so um, I think that we have to reinvent ourselves every 10 years. So this has been my interest for the last 10 years or so. That's so crazy. And just from reading your incredible book, um, Gain Without Pain, uh, I discovered that you have been into meditation, into wellness, really for a long time. Do you think that background is what enabled you to kind of take on this giant and really notice it first and foremost, and then do something about it? Good question. Yes. Uh, I've been a long time meditator off and on. And uh, I think I started coming to the realization about 10 years ago that all of my searching was, uh, in fact, looking for something that was already there. And uh, I also met a spiritual teacher named Rupert Spira, So things kind of coalesced for me and I got back to my meditation practice and, uh, you know, that, that in combination with my longstanding interest in physical fitness and 
nutritional science, um, I think all kind of pointed me in the same direction. Yeah. So to kind of talk about the elephant in the room, burnout for healthcare workers, it's something so immense, especially right now with COVID going on, they are working around the clock, you know, putting their lives at risk, putting their families' lives at risk. How do you begin to address this issue? First of all, like what is burnout to begin with? Let's talk about that first. Burnout is uh, something that we all know when we see it, even if the definition is uh, a little bit uh, vague, but generally burnout is a type of exhaustion. I think uh, emotional exhaustion, which becomes physical exhaustion, whereby people become impatient. They tend to isolate themselves. They tend to depersonalize others. And in medicine, when physicians are burnt out, there's a, a significant consequence or a number of consequences, really. Uh, the quality of health care that they provide goes down, actually. And there are more medical errors, more surgical errors, surgical infections, uh, hospital acquired infection in general, and poor outcomes. So Burnout is a very important topic, not only for healthcare workers, but also for people who may find themselves being patients. Yeah. So is this something that happens, you know, right when you start practicing medicine? Is the onslaught of burnout there? Or is this after years down the line when you're just, you're just tired and you're, you're overwhelmed? Good question. I think... Um, it's not necessarily age dependent. That is that younger physicians, and I'm sure in other healthcare areas as well, also get burnt out and, and maybe disillusioned and so on. But I think uh, one contributor to burnout is the change that's taken place over the last 10 or 20 years in medicine. So those of us that have been practicing for a while have seen conditions deteriorate. And uh, those conditions include, first of all, the culture of medicine, uh, which promotes putting patients first at our own expense, and often means working very long hours. And um, that's just sort of a given in healthcare. But over the last 20 years, a number of things have come into being that have provided substantially uh, additional stressors, and they include things like uh, HMOs, you know, whereas medicine doctor was generally in charge of their practice. Um, increasingly, there have been constraints about uh, reimbursement, complexity of reimbursement, and, uh, you know, other sort of economical constraints. Uh, and in addition to that, there's been a lot more pressure on physicians uh, to provide value and therefore there are a lot of metrics applied to us and uh, we feel that we're constantly being scrutinized and yet uh, we're not given the resources we need to make improvements. Wow. So for example, somebody who has a clinic practice may be told you have to see more patients every hour, you know, you have to generate more revenue. And on the other hand, the facilities aren't equipped for that. So there aren't enough treatment rooms, there aren't enough uh, assistants and technical staff. So the administrators and, and hospital and clinic leadership are telling doctors one thing, but it's at odds with reality, unfortunately. And so people feel very squeezed. And uh, so there's really been a number of factors, I think, that have come into medicine in the last 10 to 20 years that have, I think, contributed to this. Yeah. And I love that you're covering that because I think you know, there's there's a common perception that, you know, my doctor doesn't listen to me. They're not really interested in what I have to say. You know, they just want to prescribe this and kick me out the door. But nobody understands, you know, why that situation exists. I had no idea. Like you hear of HMOs and things like that, but you don't understand, you know, the coming down, why that's affecting all of these other people, this, this massive ripple effect that's happening. So I'm really glad that you talked about that. So we've talked about the burnout situation. Now, what do healthcare providers and the regular person do to kind of mitigate that stress, mitigate that overwhelm so that they can be more present, even in the midst of these overarching uh, new requirements? Sure. I think that, first of all, you have to look at what the drivers are of burnout and then 
figure out which of those can be changed or modified. And uh, the drivers include the culture of medicine. Again, I think putting patients first and at the expense of our health in some cases. Um, and the culture really has not been very uh, kind and gentle, shall we say, in terms of if a physician is getting stressed out and needs to talk to somebody and so on. It's been, that sort of thing has not really been in the culture of medicine. So that's a driver of burnout and, and that can be addressed. And then of course, we talked about the driver of uh, the metrics to which physicians and other healthcare workers are constantly uh, put under the microscope. So that's another aspect is really our practice, the efficiency of our practice, how much control over our practice do we have? Do we have enough time with patients? And then the third component beside the culture of medicine and efficiency of practice, let's say, is personal resilience. And that's something that we are truly responsible for. So I think the first thing in terms of dealing with burnout is recognizing what the drivers are and which of those can be modified and which cannot be modified. Mm -hmm. uh, those that cannot be modified, we just have to accept. So that's part of my uh, meditation, that which I practice and also teach, uh, which is uh, represented by the acronym GAIN, as you mentioned, the name of my book being GAIN Without Pain. And the, the G in GAIN is gratitude and the A is acceptance. So we need to sit with the things that we can't change, recognize that they bother us, kind of open our hearts to this is the way the world is and accept those things. And if there are things that are drivers of burnout that we can modify or, or change or contribute to change, we can think about whether we have the time and energy to do that. But otherwise, it's really up to us. It's our personal resilience. And that's really my area of interest. That's why I started talking about wellness and, and teaching about wellness. And I think that our personal resilience really is represented by, again, these four pillars, which are gratitude, acceptance, intention, and non-judgment. So that would be my recommendation. And, and the book describes what happiness is, compassion, these four elements, and then a meditation. And we can start with a brief meditation in the morning, and then that will help trigger our practicing and embracing these principles during the day. That's incredible. And I do think training the brain in that way from a physical standpoint, you're changing the brain, but you know, from a spiritual, emotional standpoint, it does make you more able to handle stress or a rude patient or you know, an annoying administrator who's you know coming down on you. And just having that that training that you talk about. And I love how in the book you say it only takes three minutes. Because for a lot of people, you know, the idea of sitting down to meditate is like, oh, I just I can't, I don't have the time for this. I've got so much else going on. But everybody has three minutes. Yes, and I think a lot of people have tried meditation and they they don't do it. They stop doing it or they never really got fully started. And one reason I think is that people are taught or for some reason believe that they have to sit still for 20 or 30 minutes, possibly in an uncomfortable position, and also that they should have no thoughts in their head. And so if they have thoughts kind of constantly passing through that they're failing. So... I believe that people are trying to take too big a bite. Uh, they're supposed to do it for maybe a half an hour, which may be too long. They're supposed to sit without moving, which is not correct. And the idea of not having thoughts, that's a difficult one. The reason in part that I devised this gain meditation is it's what I would consider to be a contemplative meditation. That is, you actually have thoughts. It's fine. It's part of the scheme to have thoughts. You simply direct your thoughts sort of sequentially from, from G to N and while kind of being in tune with the breath. And, and I think people can succeed. So baby bites, I think in general, repetition, that's how we learn. And here are the thoughts you can have. And it only takes three minutes to kind of go through this process. Yeah, I'm curious, when you talk about this to a big conference hall about these things, do you find that people are receptive 
to it? Do you find that they're hungry for this kind of knowledge, for this kind of information coming from another physician? Absolutely. I think we're all interested in wellness and we can all be more resilient and therefore happy. So the people are expecting a talk on, on wellness for one thing, but then um, I started at the end of the talk doing a three minute gain meditation. And that was really uh, an interesting experience having, you know, three, four, 500 people in the audience. And now I'm going to instruct them to start to just slow down their breathing and so on and close their eyes. And then I do a guided meditation. And I, at the end of the three minutes, you could hear a pin drop. Yeah. And uh, I have a lot of positive feedback for people that it really was an amazing uh, occurrence. So I'm very happy about that. Yeah, absolutely. Because I think, you know, you live in California, so I think the culture is a little more accepting, but elsewhere, you know, you're a doctor, you're supposed to be serious and science and math based, and you don't do any of this woo woo type stuff. And you certainly don't need any help. Um, you know, again, coming back to that culture of not asking for help, not needing help. Um, so this is really, really powerful and different work that you're doing. Um, I'm curious when you were doing these meditations, did anyone start crying? Did anyone come up to you after and, and, and was emotional or anything like that? Or did they kind of keep it locked down? Well, I think the people that actually approached me, uh, at the podium where I was standing were those who just had sort of a surprisingly blissful experience, but I'm sure whenever we kind of open our hearts and really uh, get into the present moment, so open-hearted, open-minded presence, things do bubble up for people. And I think I see this in my spiritual retreats that people do cry. It's, it's quite interesting mm -hmm. how we suppress so many emotions and when we allow ourselves just to sort of unveil what's inside, many things come up oh, absolutely. and all for the best, I think. Yeah. How do you recommend being able to sit with uncomfortable emotions, with pain, with suffering, you know, because you want to be happy, you want to work through these things, but how do you actually do it when someone's sitting down in meditation? And they're like, I don't like this. I don't like how this feels. I don't like the thoughts that are coming up. How do you push through that? Yes, I think that's a that's a great question. Uh, as you know from having read the book, uh, I lost my son three years ago. He was 29 years old. Um, you know, I think certainly one of the more painful experiences an adult can have. And uh, I mean, that's just uh, the sort of ultimate painful event. And I think we all have tragedy in our lives. We've all lost people that we loved, um, whether they've passed on or we've, you know, separated from them for one reason or another. Um, we all have a lot of pain and suffering that's intrinsic to life. And how do we accept this? Well, I think having some kind of guidance is helpful. The idea is to let go of the resistance. So experience the pain open your heart. And in the gain meditation, uh, after we embrace gratitude, uh, we open our hearts to acceptance. That's the G and the A. And people should expect to experience pain. But uh, I actually have an equation in my book that you may recall, since in medicine we love equations. The equation is suffering equals pain times resistance. And that is the more we resist, the more we suffer. And so the idea is through acceptance, we can decrease our resistance and, and be open to what simply is. And albeit initially that is painful. And in fact, the pain is still there when you lose a child, when you lose a loved one, what have you, the pain is always there, but the suffering is magnified by the resistance. And it, it, you're right that it is uh, painful at first, in some cases, for people to open their heart. But ultimately, there's the realization that when you peel back the layers and when you sit with this pain repetitively and accept it, you, you may realize that there's really nothing there mm -hmm. that, or that the pain is really magnified by the obsession with it and, and thoughts of the past. 
And another focus of my practice and my book is being present, you know, being mindful. This is obviously a very hot uh, issue right now is mindfulness, a lot of people embracing it. And the idea is to be present. So the suffering uh, and the resistance to that which is painful is, is really coming from dwelling on, on the past. And the cure for that is letting go, seeing what's really there and becoming present. So it's not that I'm ever gonna forget my son, that's for sure. I mean, there are adaptive considerations of the past, like savoring our good memories mm -hmm. and learning from our mistakes. But we are often beyond what's adaptive and into the realm of the maladaptive and, and obsessing over the past and the future. Certainly yeah. many of us are obsessing on the future now and, and the future brings fear and anxiety. Um, again, adaptive to look forward to positive things, family get-togethers, et cetera. Uh, adaptive to consider the future when it comes to putting food on the table. But generally beyond that, our considerations of the future are maladaptive and, and centered on fear and anxiety. So mm -hmm. the idea is rewiring our brains to be more present. And you know, there are a lot of channels to that end, I believe. Yeah. And honestly, I think that's why this whole shutdown quarantine is has been so hard for so many people. It's the not knowing, it's the worrying, having the time to really worry and have these thoughts just recirculate. Um, but I think that, I mean, what you're saying is so brilliant and so needed, um, especially right now for, you know, obviously not just healthcare workers, but for all of us um, yes. to be able to rewire. And so many people don't know the basics of meditation don't know the basics of being present. Why do you think that is? Why aren't we training every child in every school to have these skills? Because this is life saving. Absolutely, Liz. Well, it's encouraging that there there is uh, mindfulness being taught in some schools. Uh, in Oregon, there's an organization called Peace in Schools, and uh, the mindfulness component is becoming a standard. Uh, you know, classroom material for uh, school age children and, and middle schoolers and high schoolers. So it is happening on a smaller scale. You're right. I, I this should be taught in, you know, kindergarten and, uh, and, and grade school and so on, because it's so central to our happiness. And all we really want is happiness, all 7 billion of us. Right. And why are we not trained to be happier uh, from yeah. an early age, it's uh, it's an interesting question. I think yes. you know we should reconsider our curriculum and 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 consider adding mindfulness and happiness training starting at an early age. Yeah, or at the very least, you know, the woman listening to this right now, most likely she has children. You can do that. You can look at the gain meditation. You can look at different ways to teach your own children that we we don't have to wait for you know, an outside entity to, to have this information passed on to the next generation to make them better, to make them stronger. Um, so if you're listening to that, I hope you take that to heart. Um, you asked so about the pandemic, Liz, and how, you know, of course, we're fearful and anxious about the future and kind of obsessed in a maladaptive way with that. And when we think about the past and the future, we, we have a negativity bias. And when we think about the future, we catastrophize. So we're all thinking about the worst case scenario. But that's why I think the gain principles are so important, starting with gratitude. And you know, I would direct people who might be interested in the history of medicine and especially in the history of pandemics to go online and find some very graphic information out about uh, the 1918 influenza epidemic. Because again, gratitude, if you compare our conditions now and what they were like 100 years ago, and how much more horrific the influenza pandemic of 1918 was, uh, with you know literally bodies in rooms and homes on the streets and very little communication, certainly nothing like what you and I are able to have from uh, the comfort and isolation of our own homes. Things were just so much worse then. And, and if we really bring ourselves toward the idea of gratitude, uh, again, I think this is one of the pillars of being mindful and present and able to cope with this kind of situation. And we all have a lot for which to be grateful. There's no question. 
Absolutely. So we've really, we've talked a lot about the gratitude and acceptance. I kind of want to get into the intention and non-judgment because those two for me, I think is, is still a struggle. Um, yes. So talk to us a little about the intention part of the meditation. Right. So gratitude, acceptance, intention. Intention is really central to uh Mindfulness, for example, where as defined by John Kabat-Zinn, uh, mindfulness is essentially bring yourself to the present moment intentionally uh, and with purpose. So we kind of forget that we can guide our thoughts and we can actually rewire our brains if we're purposeful about it. There's a terrific and very interesting project that's been going on at Duke University for many years called Three Good Things. And the idea is that people can enter the study as a participant online, and one takes a quality of life questionnaire or survey uh, prior to starting the program. And then the program simply at its core is that each evening before we go to sleep, we think of three good things that happen during the day. So for example, tonight, uh, you know, I had a nice cup of coffee and, and listened to NPR. Uh, I had a lovely time with Liz on her program. Uh, I went for a nice bike ride. I had a good meal. So whatever the three good things are, we think of those before we go to sleep at night. And that's kind of contrary to what our minds normally do, which is because of our negativity bias, we tend to mull over the, the worst things about the day. So according to the program, one thinks of three good things before going to bed. And what they find is, as people take repeat quality of life surveys, you know, as they're doing this three good things practice, people sleep better and they become substantially happier people. And again, this is a non-time consuming practice. It's simply thinking of three good things at the end of the day, each evening, and uh, that is an excellent example of how we can rewire our brains from being very negative to being much more positive and optimistic if we, if we exercise intention to do that. And, and everything takes purposefulness. You know, we don't make gains. We don't become physically stronger if we're going to the gym or, you know, better runner if we're doing that or a better student or a better teacher, a better parent without applying intention. So this is no different. We just attend to our mind uh, and we can actually rewire our, the way we think. I love that. I mean, it is, it's such a small act that reaps such huge benefits. I love yes. it. Okay. So let's talk about the last one, non-judgment, because I don't know. I think it's another hardwired thing where we're constantly judging situations and people and circumstances. So how in the world do you shut that down? Well, Liz, that's another good question. Um, Non-judgment, um, somebody thought when they, when they read the first version of my book, uh, well, isn't acceptance the same thing as non-judgment? And it's not because acceptance is considering something painful and opening our heart to it and, and just letting it be as it is. Non-judgment is not assigning an adjective of good or bad to everything. And, and you're right, our minds are constantly churning and you know, we've actually learned something about the neurophysiology of judgment. That is the network of nerves that are firing from one part of our brain to another as we determine, oh, this is good, that's bad, for example. Um, and we are constantly comparing one thing to another and, and to ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so we're thinking, well, this person is smarter than I am. That person is better looking than I am or not as good looking as I am or too fat or too thin, uh, too short. Um, and it's this constant judging that actually is exhausting and also detracts from our happiness. If we can simply, again, using our, our intention, bring ourselves to look at the world in a very neutral way with uh, what uh, a spiritual teacher, uh, Francis Lucille said was benevolent indifference. Mm -hmm. So it's not to say that we don't have 
really deep enjoyment and, and appreciation of the beauty around us is simply to look at the world around us as it is and simply let go of any judgment. Uh, I was at a uh, Qigong workshop with a wonderful teacher whose name is Ming Tong. And he had us do an exercise where we, the group of us sat on the floor and we paired off and we faced each other. And one member of the pair was instructed to say, you are good repeatedly to the other person. And then we switched places. And then the first person was instructed to say, you are bad repeatedly to the other person. And then we switched places. And at the end, Ming Tong asked us, how did it feel to say you are good? And of course, everybody thought it felt great. Right. Um, it's nice to compliment other people. And he said, how did it make you feel to say you are bad? And most people said, you know, oh, it was negative. It was not, not nice. And I was thinking, no, I, I, there's something here that I'm, I, I don't necessarily agree with. This was felt good or this felt bad. And, and then he clarified why we did this exercise, which was to make the point that it's better not to make any judgment at all because the person that says you are good now is judging you and five minutes mm -hmm. from now or tomorrow mm -hmm. or next week, they might judge you poorly. What if we just don't make any judgment at all? And as we practice non-judgment, I think we feel an energy. We feel kind of a positive sensation and uh, in my book, I tell the story of my morning bike ride to the hospital from my lovely home on Stanford campus. And I ride through uh, down a lane, which is very narrow and it's got a beautiful canopy of trees. It's just so lovely in the morning and, and in the afternoon on my way home as well. So I'm riding my bicycle down this lane and ahead of me is uh, somebody on foot and they're walking in the same direction I'm riding. And as I get a little closer, I see, well, they're right in the middle of the lane. You know, they're right in the middle of the path. I'm not going to get by them. And then as I get closer, I see that they've got buds in their ears and they're looking at their screen. So I've already made five or six judgments. Uh, the person is inconsiderate. They're standing in the middle of the, of the path. They're not connected. We're in this beautiful environment covered with, you know, beautiful trees and, and blooming plants. And they're looking at a screen and, you know, the birds are chirping and they've got buds in their ears. So they're just kind of disconnected. So I've made all these judgments. And then I kind of smile to myself and get back to my gain practice and realize that morning with my meditation, one of my intentions was to drop any judgment today, the first person mm -hmm. I saw and, and so on. And so I just sort of relaxed and let go of the judgment. And as I ride by the person, we look at each other and smile. And mm -hmm. it, it's a pleasant experience. So I've converted a sort of a, you know, judgmental, nasty, potentially experience to just a, a benevolent little hit of dopamine. And so it, it just sort of, as we practice, we are in a positive feedback loop whereby the practice brings us happiness and happiness wants to make us practice. Wow. And I love that you were honest with that. I mean, you're supposed to be someone who, you know, has got this all figured out and, you know, <laughs> a little moment like that, you still had to check yourself and bring yourself back, but it shows, you know, your training, your mental training and, and how easily you're able to like get back to center, get back to homeostasis. I love that story. Well, we have covered so much. Um, if there were one thing that you really wanted to leave the listener with today, after everything that we've talked about, after everything that you are continuing to put out into the world, what would that be? Well, I think that uh, everybody should understand that being present is being happy. If we think about our happiest moments, they are when we lose a sense of separation. And so whether it's, you know, being with a couple of other people and laughing uncontrollably at a joke, we all know we're laughing at the same thing and we're not really thinking about the past or the present, uh, excuse me, the past or the future, we are really present. Um, so how do we be more present? and? I would just go back to the principles of gain. I, I just would ask everyone whether or not they 
get the book and do the three minute meditation to just focus on these four principles about gratitude, acceptance, intention, and non-judgment. I, I would make that into one message. And just, even if you just take one element and intentionally practice it uh, for a few moments a day and pick another one the next day, I think that things will build and you'll get positive feedback and you'll wanna do more and, and I think you'll be happier and that's the goal, is it not? In life is, is peace and happiness. And my teacher said that peace is happiness at rest and happiness is peace in motion, which I thought was very beautiful. So let's be happier and more peaceful by embracing game. I love it. I love it. So beautifully said. Um, so where can our listener find out more about you? Get the book. Tell us all the things. Sure. My uh, website, which is a work in progress, this is a new venture for me, uh, is simply all lowercase greghammermd.com. It's G-R-E-G-H-A-M-M-E-R-M-D.com. And there's a link to Amazon to pre-order the ebook. The paper bound version of the book uh, will be available on May 15th, as will the ebook. So uh, there's more information there and I'll be building that website up as we move along with additional links and more information. Beautiful. Well, I love this interview. I love this topic. I love the work that you're putting out into the world. The book itself is brilliant and just super easy to read. And I was interested the entire time. So uh, that's saying something. <laughs> so thank you so much, Dr. Hammer. Thank you for the work that you're doing in the world. And thank you for, for being vulnerable and, and sharing your light. Well, likewise, Liz, thank you very much for having me and doing the good work that you do as well. You have been listening to the Motherhood Unstressed Podcast, and I'm your host, Liz Carlisle. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you love this episode, please share it out with a friend or on social media. Please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. You just have to hit those five stars. You don't even have to write anything. And uh, as always, make sure that you're subscribed so that you never miss a guided meditation every Wednesday or every Monday, an interview with an amazing guest doing amazing work in the world. Thanks.